Welcome everyone to episode 31 of Teach Tech Play. I'm Eleni Karitsis and I'm the host and founder of Teach Tech Play. Today we have a fantastic lineup of presenters from all over the world sharing some of the best practices they do in their classroom. But before we get started, I'd like to throw over to my co-host Steve and would you like to say hello to everyone? Hello everybody, really excited. We've got a really packed lineup tonight and it's a lineup where we've got some people from Canada, from, from, from Hawaii and then from all the way from Mildura as well, as well as all across Australia. So I'm really excited about this one, Lenny. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. And it is a great one because neither you or I need to present this month. So we get a month off. <laughs> But before we get started, I'd just like to congratulate episode 30's winner, Matt Hendrick. Now, he shared a wonderful tool of right ideas in the classroom through the um, iPad app. And I know I've started using that in my classroom and it is seriously amazing. So if you haven't had a chance to watch last month's episode, I would highly recommend checking it out. Not only was Matt's fantastic, but I think all the presenters, Steve and I reflected and said it was probably one of our favourite shows in a while, not saying any, none of them are bad, but it just had lots of practical great ideas, which we absolutely love. But let's get started with tonight's show. Um, we have some fantastic presenters, as we said, and make sure that you do vote for your favourite presenter. Um, the voting link is now up on the screen. You can also find the voting on our website. So that's teachtechplay.com forward slash web show. And that's where you can also see all of our past episodes. Now, all the way from Hawaii, we have got Matt. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, Matt, and what you do? Sure, um, been teaching for about 30 years. Uh, moved to Hawaii six years ago. Um, currently, I'm working at a private school in Honolulu. I'm the K-6 STEM and Fab Lab teacher. Fantastic, and I know STEM and Fab Labs are uh, happening all over Melbourne and in Australia at the moment, so I'm excited to hear how you're using that in your school and getting some practical ideas from you as well. So thank you for joining us today, and um, we're excited to have you. Next, we've got Ben, and Ben's not far from me. He's in Melbourne, but I know Ben's been doing some fantastic things in his classroom with his students. So, Ben, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I work at uh, Peninsula Grammar um, as a year two teacher slash daily organiser. So, big advocate of tech in the classroom for sure, though. And ben. playing, of course. <laughs> Fantastic, Ben. We're excited to have you here and you'll be sharing with us design thinking routines tonight. So yep. that's really exciting. Now, the next person I have had the pleasure of mentoring um, through the Google Teacher Academy. Um, and Trevor is someone who I don't think I would have been in contact with unless he chose me to be his mentor. So I feel very privileged. But he is doing some fantastic things around um, space and in Canada so I don't want to share too much but Trevor do you want to say a little bit about yourself and I know that your life of where you've taught just blows me away every time so <laughs> I'll awesome some pictures tonight too and I'm the fortunate one to, that you accepted me as uh, taking me on as a mentor so I appreciate that I'm in the Okanagan Valley which is a wine valley in Canada I'll show you some pictures in a little bit uh, and I'm a district career coordinator for the Marshall district uh, that I work in Fantastic. And you have also worked in Australia before, and you've also worked in the Arctic Circle, which blows me away. And this ties in well, because I'm going to have some pictures tonight. Oh, I won't. Oops, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> the ways, when you first told me that, I was blown away, so it was great to connect. <laughs> Next, we have Fiona, and Fiona is from Mildura, so out in the country of Victoria on the border of pretty much New South Wales and South Australia, pretty much. And I have known Fiona since my first year of teaching. We've connected many, many times. So it's great to have her on the show. So Fiona, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Thanks, Eleni. Um, I've been in Mildura for seven years now and I, this year I'm the um, digital tech mentor for my school. We're a prep to 10 school. So my job is to mentor the primary teachers in getting technology into their classroom. But I also teach prep after lunch, year one integrated studies, year three, four poetry and year seven digital tech. So sort of wherever we need a gap filled, 
there I am. <laughs> fantastic. And I know you're doing some fantastic things across the school. So great to have you on the show tonight as well. And finally, someone who is returning, who I sometimes feel you're a bit of the face of Teach Tech Play, Trent, um, especially from the conference and everything, your photos. I think it must be your height, you just stand out. But we're, it's fantastic to have you back again and you'll be sharing something a little bit different. Um, I know you're, in the past you've shared a lot about Microsoft, but tonight something you're sharing is something you actually did with my students. So. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your role this year? Because I know it's changed as well since last time you were on the show. Yeah, it has. Thanks, Eleni, and g'day, everybody. Um, very excited to be here again and coming back to share something with you. Uh, in the past, I've worked as a Microsoft Learning Consultant. So um, I'm first and foremost a teacher, taught in primary schools and secondary schools and led in my schools as well. Um, and last year, I was working for Microsoft as a teacher ambassador. So um, helping lots of teachers and schools around Australia to support them with using the technologies in their classroom. And then this year, I've actually just started up working for myself and working closely with lots of different schools to help help them integrate technology more meaningfully. And I've had a great opportunity to work with Eleni in her classroom. So I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, something called Make Do and a little project that we worked on. So I'm excited to share about it. Fantastic, Trent. So that is everybody for tonight's show. And each presenter will have four minutes to share what they have been sharing or doing in their classroom. So I'm excited to kick off the show first with Matt all the way from Hawaii. Hi. I've never gone, but hope one day to get there. So let me know when you're ready, Matt, and I'll start the timer. Let me get the screen up. Yep. Is it there? Yep, perfect. Okay, full screen? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, what I do is I run the, the STEM Fab Lab for the lower school here um, at Iolani, and one of the things we use most often is the laser cutter. Um, so I wanna take you through just a couple of projects that we do at different grade levels to kind of share some of the math um, topics that we put into those projects. So, here we go. Um, first with kindergarten. Obviously, they start with the basic shapes, comparing objects basic 2D, 3D geometry, basic addition and subtraction. So one of the projects we do with them is they have a garden outside and they used to make their garden signs out of cardboard and chopsticks. But when the rain would come or the first uh, sprinkler would go off, they would get wet. So what we did is we took them through kind of a design thinking project where they made a sign on a big piece of paper. Then we asked them to narrow it down to a small three by five card. Uh, we brought them into the lab, showed them how we scan it uh, we sent it to the laser cutter, then we talked about what would a stake look like, what would a sign look like, what shapes, and they came up with the kind of rectangular shape and the, the long stick. Um, so we designed that, and then I laser cut it, gave it to them, and they put it off in their garden. Um, another project they do is a Christmas ornament. Uh, similarly, they draw a picture, um, put it on a piece of wood, and then they decorate it. The teacher decoupages their a picture of their photo on the other side. They give that uh, for their parents for Christmas. Um, our first graders also start working a little bit with the laser cutter again with shape, symmetry, uh, 3D and 2D geometry as well as addition and subtraction. Um, and they make Christmas ornaments, but they use a, a program called Kid Picks to design their picture online. Uh, then we print it, we scan it, they come in and digitize it um, with an app from the iPad send it to the laser cutter, I cut it out for them, they take it to class and they color it and send it home. Um, as they get older, obviously we do more and more. So sixth grade, um, ratio and proportion relationships, and you can see all the math subjects that they do. So there's a couple of big projects, two I just wanna quickly highlight. Um, the first one is ancient Egyptian artifacts. In the fall, they study ancient Egypt and they have to create an artifact, do research on it and present it. So when the lab started three years ago, it gave them the opportunity to come in and use 3D printers and laser cutters. Um, and these are a couple of projects that these two kids made, a sword and then a bow and arrow. But then there were also some others, the sarcophagus that you see there on the left. Um, the girls sketched that out of, or, or traced that out of a book. We scanned it, laser cut it, um, she put it together. And then on the right, you see some of the other projects that kids have made um, with the laser cutter as well. They also, in the fall, um, study medieval uh, culture 
And one of the things they do in their science class is they um, used to make catapults. They used to just make them out of cardboard. But again, when we started the lab, we took those cardboard prototypes, um, turned them into uh, blueprints, basically, had the kids scan them, trace them, um, and then laser cut them. And then the teacher takes them outside. They have to collect data. They have to change the angle. They have to change the number of rubber bands. Um, and they shoot those off. And uh, basically, that's part of their, their science curriculum. So uh, this is just a, a link to a bunch of makerspace resources. Um, some, most of them I think are, are uh, laser cut stuff, but there's other stuff in there as well. Um, and that's kind of about it. Um, mahalo means thank you in Hawaii and aloha. At the bottom of my email, um, our blog site, we try to keep track of everything we do in the lab, um, as well as our Twitter handle. So that is it for me. Fantastic. 16 seconds to go. You set a benchmark. <laughs> I'm from New York, so I'm used to talking fast. Oh, perfect. But Matt, that is absolutely fantastic. I think um, integrating STEM and maker into junior classrooms is always a challenge for teachers, I think, in them getting their head around ways that they can actually do it. And I think some of the ways you showed us are practical ways, especially with the garden and getting them to think of a problem and then apply it to um, something they can make straight away. And I think that's really key when we do these maker-centered learning tasks and activities through STEM, that it's actually got a purpose. So thank you for sharing some of those fantastic um, lesson ideas and what you are doing. Did anyone else have any questions or comments? Yeah, I do, Eleni. Um, Matt, one of the things that, that, I, that I loved about that work is that it had such roots in, in, in sort of typical classroom practice. So, because normally people think technology is an event. What you've done is it really embedded it in your curriculum. One question I'm, I'm keen to know is, do your students now come up to you and say, I've got an idea for laser cutting? Is it like, because you've sort of exposed them to this new way of doing things, do they now think with the laser cutter in mind? Yeah, they sure do. I mean, we've got laser cutters, 3D printers. We've got a, a desktop CNC mill. Um, we have tons of cardboard as well and, you know, copper tape and LEDs. So um, this being the end of our third year, we've exposed them to a lot. So you'll have kids that'll come in and say, oh, I want to make my mom a, a Mother's Day present for on a laser cutter. Here's my idea. And they'll do prototypes and things like that. Um, you'll have kids that come in and say, oh, I want to do, you know, make this for a project that I'm doing in class, or I want to make um, a sign for, for my mom or my dad's office. So, yeah, they sure do. And I think the more they're exposed to it, um, the more they're going to come up with those ideas and try to solve those problems. And, and for us, it's more that mentality, that, that maker mentality, that, you know, tinkering mentality. I have a problem. How can I solve it? And whether it's through high-tech laser cutters or, um, you know, with a piece of cardboard. We try to give them the opportunity to do all that. That's just brilliant. <clears throat> Anybody else have any questions? Ben? Hello. Um, I was just wondering, do the kids, um, like, have a, an extra degree of motivation when the laser cutting is the, the, the final stage in the project? Do they sort of sustain their engagement throughout? Yeah, it's... Sort of it's it's much more engaging than the, than the 3D printer. The 3D printer, if you see them, they obviously take a long time. Um, the laser cutter, you know, you'll have bursts of flames every now and then. And when they're watching, oh, look at that. Oh, it's on fire. Oh, no, it's not. Um, you know, so, so things like that do draw them in a little bit. And you can, unless it's a really big project, they can cut, you know, probably those Christmas ornaments out in maybe a minute and a half for each one. So the kid can actually stand there and watch them, have watch yep. their... Um, then get cut out. Um, you know, and obviously the younger ones don't do a lot of the technical side of stuff, but as they get older, we introduce more and more and kind of scaffold them up so that by the time they're in yeah. sixth grade. Yeah, cool. Fantastic. Next up, we have got Ben, and Ben, you'll be sharing a little bit about design thinking routines, and I think that might be a bit of a theme of tonight's show, um, yeah. looking seeing what everybody is sharing, but it's always exciting to see the different ways people do design thinking routines. I, I, every time I hear another person share what they're doing, it gets me excited because I think of ways I can 
take that and do something in my own classroom. So Ben, when you're ready, let me know and I will start the timer. Cool, I'll just get my... Uh, there we go. Can you see me all good? It's just loading. So I recently completed a course um, all about uh, thinking and making in the learner center, learning and thinking in a maker center classroom. So I just wanted to share a little bit about what uh, we did in the classroom um, and ben how I sort of implemented specific thinking routines Sorry, ben, um, just with my students. Can Steve, can you see his screen? No, Ben, we just can't see your screen yet. No, now? Yeah. Yes, now we can, perfect. Cool. I'll start the timer. All righty, so if I could kick things off with a bit of a video my students made um, about design and trying to increase sensitivity to design, um, which basically means walking around the environment and analyzing uh, objects and the, their design features. The playground is designed for people to play on. It helps kids to learn their muscles. The pedestrian crossing is a simple design. It helps people be able to cross the road safely. This vehicle is designed for speed. This vehicle is designed for one person. The game of chess was designed over 1,500 years ago. Its design is forward. Thank you for watching! So, <clears throat> we, we uh, learnt about thinking routines and it really gave us an opportunity to slow down and just really analyze the parts, purposes, and complexities of different objects. So the parts being everything that's put into an object. Um, <clears throat> the purpose is how the parts work together and the complexities being um, sort of what's difficulties come about when the parts are interacting looking at cogs and things like that, um, lasers and electricity. And so what the kids did was dismantle a um, DVD player. And as we dismantled it, we talked about every single part in the DVD player, you know, from screws to the casing to uh, the motherboard. Um, and so it really opens up students' sort of mindsets about how many different things it takes to create one object. Um, but I found with this particular thinking routine, you can link it to any part of the curriculum. curriculum. I um, linked it to the alphabet and we talked about letters being the parts and what is the purpose of the letters and the complexities are how the words um, are spelt and how the letters come together to make different sounds. Um, I think cardboard is a bit of a theme for today as well. <laughs> um, we, I took my students down to the Year 10 Science Lab and we used Google Cardboard for a session um, and they loved it. And then when I took them back to the classroom, we started talking about the iPads and how we could um, transfer um, the VR elements to the iPads, but there's no device or... Uh, no device that links to iPad. So we made our own iPad uh, Google card box, cardboard. So that was quite cool. But the thinking routine is how can things be more effective? How can things be more efficient? How can things be more ethical? And how things can be more beautiful? And so you, you choose an object and you, you just run through these ideas as part of a conversation. Um, Another thinking routine we used was called parts, people, and interactions. So you, you choose a system. We chose the school system. And the students drew all the parts of the system and how they linked together. Um, and they talked about all the people within the system and how those people interact with other people in the system. 
And so you see in the bottom left of that picture was uh, the oval. So you can see kind of how um, the system highlights what the students think are important. In this case, sport was what was most important. Um, the last one was a think, feel, care thinking routine. And that was um, primarily talking about people and how they think about their system. Uh, what kind of emotions come um, from there when they are doing their role in the system and um, care was how they care about other people in the system. So this was a picture of one of the students drew of me and the other year two teacher. So we were kind of like the epicenter of the system, which was quite cool. I was, I was very honored to have that. Um, and that's pretty much what we did. Um, I introduced the thinking routines um, as part of a curriculum. I sort of ran through spelling and literacy and then said, all right, we've got 20 minutes. Let's have a look at these thinking routines just so I could establish a good understanding of um, you know, design thinking within the classroom and establish some sort of fundamental um, habits around design thinking and trying to just increase like inclination towards analyzing design objects in the environment um, and sort of developing sensitivity towards, you know, opportunities for design. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Fantastic, Ben. And I know seeing that I can relate to everything you did because I actually did the same course as you <laughs> did. The, um, I'm totally um, cheating, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's good because I, you weren't in my sort of reflection group as part of that Harvard course of teaching and learning in the Maker Centre classroom. So um, seeing what you did uh, compared to the people in my group is really interesting to see. And uh, I think for me, the thinking routine was that imagine if was a real wow point for my students that idea of transforming and changing something that we use and for me we, yeah. we used the clock because we were currently looking at time and clocks and the idea yeah. they came up with were absolutely amazing how to make it more beautiful and efficient you know i always forget about fruit snack and they're like you can program it into the clock so it has an alarm that comes out and their ideas that came from it were just phenomenal and yeah. i what i even got out of it was through the thinking routines, we lose trust in our students that they can do things and that they can think beyond what we actually can think of ourselves. Yeah. And that was the biggest eye opener for me. So it was good seeing what your students being a year younger than mine, what they came up with. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Did anybody else have That's anything right. to say? I do, Eleni. Um, ben, that's sure. awesome, and there's a there's a great range of those thinking routines happening in your classroom. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Are you finding that once you're doing this in your classroom um, with your students regularly, that they're starting to use the thinking routines when you're not scaffolding it for them? Yeah, I um, definitely think that happens. Obviously, you've got to do it enough so that it sticks. But after a while, it really empowered the students. Um, we talked a lot about sensitivity to design. And so it's almost like they feel, the students feel like they need permission to critique design objects. Whereas you really want them just to be able to have a look at something and go, oh yeah, that's good. It could be better this way. It could be better that way. Um, well, I had one student, and this is a bit of a standout, when we were doing the iPad Google Cardboard, he actually went home and made his own Google Cardboard um, glasses from scratch. <laughs> it was amazing. I've got this um, great memory from his, his mum who emailed me and said, have a look at this, patent pending, you know, and it was, he was, you know, only seven years old and he took the initiative um, to go home at night and make his own Google Cardboard. So it was amazing. It was really cool. Fantastic, Ben. Next up, we have got Trevor who will be sharing Space School, which is something I know he has been working on for probably the last six, seven months. So when you're ready, Trevor, let me know and I will start the timer. I think I just need Ben to turn off his screen share. You should be able to jump over um, the top of him. Says I can't do it while someone else is. Oh, yeah. Ben, if you just want to stop screen sharing. There we go. Perfect.
Just loading. Ready when you are. I would just say that at the beginning that I got called Space School. I just do some slides for sort of build up on how I got to Space School. I'd like to think myself as an honorary Australian. Um, my wife and I did our teaching year down in the University of Wollongong, so we had a great year down in Australia. And I thought I'd actually teach you, the, show you, this is my very first lesson that I ever taught. This was in Hilston, New South Wales. And I taught the students there a little bit about Canada and the provinces that we have there. And then I went on to do a practicum at, at St. Mary's and another a number of other schools in, in New South Wales. About a month after getting back from Australia, I took my first teaching job at the very top of Canada in Tuktoyaktuk, which is in the Arctic Circle in Canada. So going from that extreme of uh, the beach in Australia to the beach of the Arctic Ocean was, was quite an experience for me. So this is where I am now. I'm in the Okanagan Valley in Canada, which is a wine valley. So uh, this is where I grew up too, uh, my wife and I. So this is where I'm teaching. And this is another picture of where I live. So this is my commute every morning as I head down to the community that's just down the lake of, of where I work every day. This is mostly what I do. This I transition students to apprenticeship programs uh, here in Canada in terms of mechanics and heavy duty and so forth. What I also have is I have a lot of flexibility in my job in terms of uh, I've been able to do space projects. This is an Argisat project that I was involved with. So this is the test one that we're allowed to use in the classroom. And this is one of the students in the class testing out the camera on the little mic nano satellite that actually uh, is up in space. And then I actually had students that while it was live, we were one of the first groups in Canada that actually have access to a live satellite. And the students could actually track it as it orbited the Earth. We've also been able to video conference with a number of Canadian astronauts, which was really cool. And this was a STEM project that we worked on. We worked on sending a balloon up into space, a weather balloon. So this is the students working on putting it together. And this is how it ended up. It ended up uh, hooked up on the dentist's office, uh, on the pole outside the dentist's office. So fortunately, we tried in, and a few days later, this is what we pulled off. And so that's up to about 120,000 feet, about 36 kilometers up. Uh, there's another shot of it. You can see open lake is below. That's right when the balloon popped. So that leads me to Space School. This is a resource that I developed for teachers and students. Uh, anybody can use it. It's a big resource in terms of, I wanted to inspire students in terms of what's possible in space. There's lots of exciting things going on now. I also tie it in with STEM and design thinking and computer coding and getting students uh, learning these skills that not only will benefit them in a career in space industry if they choose that, but really these are technology skills that they can uh, benefit them in any industry. Uh, there's lots of satellite resources. There's obviously a lot of robotics on the site. Uh, lots of computer coding. Obviously, uh, technology runs most of these space industries. Uh, lots on the International Space Station. Uh, there's also, I've broken up resources for different categories in teacher elementary. There's lots of lesson plans and lesson ideas for teachers. Uh, obviously, SpaceX is a big part of the website in terms of all the exciting stuff they do. They do So really, this is a resource, spaceschool.ca, for any teachers and students that are really excited about space. This one has a particular kind of Canadian twist on it, but there's lots of resources and uh, videos and so forth that can really benefit students and teachers. Wonderful, with 10 seconds to spare. Well done, Trevor. Now, I know I'm talking you through the process of Space School, and it's really exciting to see how it has developed over the last sort of six to eight months. So um, I was, I've had a chat with you a few weeks ago and sort of felt, yep, I think it's ready. Let's share it and see what other people think. And I know you're open to feedback as well. So if anyone's got suggestions or other ideas to also make sure they put that in contact because what you have been doing with your students and being able to capture and put that together on a website for everybody is absolutely phenomenal. And I know I'm grateful because we are doing a space unit next term and I know where my first quarter call is going to be. Now, did anybody else have any questions or comments? Because I'm sure somebody does, especially in relation to the balloon up in space. Um, this, this is incredible. Like, I'm just looking at this. And I can't even 
formulate a question because it looks absolutely amazing. Like there's so much there and so much to talk about, you know, like the maths and science behind it, the like the English capabilities, the questioning, like the design thinking, um, it just all ties in together. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Trevor, <laughs> what's there? Trevor, Sarah, I'm going to do a big space unit. I'm definitely going to tr uh, give this over to our science teacher. She's going to love it. Thanks. That would be great. Trevor, I would, uh, the balloon experiment, I suppose one of the gauge, gauges for me for student motivation is students wanting to work through their lunchtime, come in before school, after school. I would imagine that you would have had kids knocking down the door and, and hanging about trying to get that because it's just so irresistible in terms of motivation but also possibility did you have that uh, that feeling with kids when you were working with them yeah exactly it was fun because i had a, actually had it hanging in my uh in my classroom in my office so often students would be coming in seeing what's going on seeing what's changing we also had all the all all the departments involved so we had obviously we had the tech and the and the trades involved very involved in terms of building it but then the art students were also involved in terms of painting it all we had uh, the textiles department making straps for the balloons and so forth. So it was, it was neat to have it all tied together. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well done. And I Trevor, love how you integrated sort of the whole school. It wasn't just the people who did sort of technology and coding, but how you just said it incorporated the whole school community. Everyone had a part, everyone had a purpose to make it what it was. So. Yeah, it actually worked out well. But at that time, I wasn't really a classroom teacher. So in that sense, I was able to incorporate sort of many different people from many different classrooms. And uh, fortunately, after that first uh, failure, we, we did try it again. And the second one worked. And what I think were they, Trevor? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say failure is the number one thing that it is your yeah. first attempt. And that it's, it was probably, I actually see it as a good thing that it did fail that first time because then it shows the students that it doesn't always work and that's okay as well, that you have yeah. to get through it again. That's just me and my thinking in my back of my head. It's always good when some things don't work. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Was there another question there too? Yeah. I was just wondering what age group did you do that with? So that was high school for the balloon. So that was grade nine through 12 here in Canada. Fantastic. We might keep moving. And if anyone has any further questions, I'm sure Trevor would love to hear from you and to get in contact with him. And you can find him on Twitter or reach out via Space School. Next up, we have Fiona and she'll be sharing with us digital breakouts. So Fiona, let me know when you're ready and I'll start the timer. Alrighty, let's have a go. Just sharing my screen now. Can anyone, everyone see that? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, last year, my husband and I went to an adventure room in Adelaide and I had no idea what it was about. And basically we had to escape a room within 60, uh, 60 minutes. We had three other friends with us and we were faced with challenges to escape this room using clues, logical thinking, illogical thinking um, and lots of different, yeah, things like that. It was, you know, we walked in and the first thing we were handcuffed to a wall and then they turned the lights out and I was like, I had no idea what was going on. And um, the, the concept behind it was a teacher decided to create, you know, this breakout education to get her students working collaboratively together to solve problems in her science class because her science classes were getting a bit mundane, she was a bit bored and so were they. Um, so that's where the idea of um, this breakout technology or education sort of came from. And there's actually a whole world out there. And I've got the website up here on digital breakouts. So um, the whole idea is that it's basically a, um, a Google form that you use conditional formatting with. And um, I did some very quick learning on conditional formatting when I first started um, on what that was and how it worked um, because my aim was to create my own. I was like, you know what, everyone, there's this great site, you know, how down here it says you can build your own. I was like, yes, let me do this. So I started with um, over here, it's the, the how to, but before I did that, I actually went, here is like heaps of games, you know, and this one's designed from K to five, um, you know, three to five, three to five can collaborate and K to two um, players, a whole class. and. This one's about place value and reading. So it's all about integrating it into your um, subjects. 
Um, and like this website here has like so many, like this is a Minecraft themed one. It's got a, a difficulty level of three, um, good for upper elementary. So they're all sort of um, placed around, you know, leveled as to how hard they are and what their, their topics are. So you can sort of find one, like, you know, if you've got a maths concept that you want to um, get kids working collaboratively with and sort of demonstrating their knowledge, you choose a maths one and things like that. So um, I was like, you know what, these are all great, but I was like, you know, I couldn't find any poetry ones, you know, like poetry. <laughs> Some kids aren't exactly, you know, jumping for joy when you mention poetry, but that's my year three, four class on a Thursday is poetry. And um, we'd been doing haikus and I thought, you know what, um, there's only so much you can do with a haiku. It's only got 17 syllables. Um, so I thought I'm going to, you know, create my own. So I went to work in the holidays and... Um, over here where it says build your own, I click there and this is what it comes up with, um, how to create a form. So basically creating a Google form, which has got conditional formatting and then I embedded that into a Google site. So you don't have to be a Google One school minute. to do this. Um, and yeah, so I went through how to make a locked form, how to embed it on a Google site. Um, and basically it comes up, what, what you create is a site or a, a form. So I'll show you the one that I created um, this is mine. It's very personal because I've got my name. Mrs. Hudson has collected all your gymnastics excursion notes, you know, like, so they, they thought this was like, real, you know, like they were stressing they couldn't go to gymnastics um, if she, you know, couldn't find it. So all the information on this page relates to haikus and I told them that basically everything on this page could be a clue. So down here I've got my, my um, embedded Google form here and they had to come up with the answers. So the three digit lock, they had I said, you know, it's not just a random number, it's three numbers that have something to do with what's on this page. So some of the kids are like, you know, oh, they clicked this button here and it took them to another website um, that they could, it was a jigsaw planet one where I made the jigsaw and you put it together and it creates a clue. So um, then they could go back and fill it in. And um, if you put the wrong answer in, it says, oh, it's still locked. So that sort of gave them the idea that, right, we've got to think of something else that's not right. So they came up with, you know, 575. Five. That's how many syllables are in a haiku, five, then seven, then five. So most of them um, worked in pairs, but then you just had some kids who took their iPads and they're like, um, you know, I'm going to do this by myself. And just seeing that they were so motivated um, to get this done. It was all about what we've been doing in class. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And I've created this one and I'm hoping to create more. And I have done some with the staff as well, just ready-made ones. And they're probably the people that needed the most scaffolding and the most help because it just shows, you know, that just the, the level of the thinking and sometimes it just doesn't make sense for teachers. So getting them to do that creative thinking. So, yeah, um, digital breakout. So, yeah, head to the website and there's heaps of stuff there to get you started. Wonderful. Thank you, Fiona. And sorry about that. I um, had myself <laughs> mute, so I didn't actually get to. I was so intrigued in what you were sharing. <laughs> all good. All good. It's absolutely fantastic how you've seen something, adjusted it and applied it to make your lessons more interesting. And I think that a lot of the things that are coming out, like Breakout EDU and all these other things, if you haven't got a clear purpose, don't do it. Like, and that's my whole sort of philosophy. It's got to have a purpose of why you're actually doing it and don't just do it for the sake of doing it. And I think you found a clear connection there and you thought, Hey, Haku, how many, how much can I really teach them on this? I need to think of a way. And then you saw this and you made something from it. And that's absolutely fantastic. Um, the it way you were basically that I knew digital breakouts existed and I wanted to do one. <laughs> and so I forced it into my curriculum, but I had to make it relevant. I was like, I really want to do this. It's really yeah. cool. But I had to find a way. <laughs> and I think that's the absolute key is that if you want something to work, you'll find ways to connect it. And I think a lot of teachers get into the habits of thinking, oh, it's too hard. I'll just go with what I've always done. And, you know, we're not exposing our students to those opportunities to think differently, to try something a little bit different. So well done in doing that. Did anybody else have any comments or questions? I do, yeah. Eleni. Um, oh, go, Steve. No, you're all right, mate. Go ahead. Um, well, one of the things that I love about it is that sort of like such critical thinking involved in them trying to solve that problem. So that's one of the things I think is awesome about it. Um, 
how long did it take you to put together your sort of um, breakout that you created for your class? Because I know time's always a factor when we're thinking yeah. about ways to integrate things into our curriculum. So how long did it take you to put that one together? Okay, so some people say not to prepare, like spend time preparing a lesson longer than it takes the students to do it. Uh, I'm a bit, <laughs> I'm a bit out on that. This probably took me. Um, look, I know how to use Google Forms in a basic sense. I had to learn a little bit more. So for someone that had no idea about Google Forms, it would take them a little bit longer. Um, so it probably took me probably an hour, and that was to source my information and my websites and things like that. So it took me about an hour, and it took the kids probably about 40, 45 minutes. Some didn't get it solved. They, you know, they were, if they had maybe an extra 10 minutes, they would have, you know, cracked the code. Um, but it was, yeah, it took me about an hour. The next one, you know, would be a lot quicker. Um, but then you could spend a lot longer and make it more tricky and more difficult. So there's, you know, I did probably the basic things. I started with what I sort of knew bits and pieces of how to do. Um, but I'd like to make a more challenging one or, you know, for myself, challenge myself a bit more as well. So um, I did do it in the school holidays um, when I had a little bit extra time. Um, but yeah, it, it did take a little, it wasn't like a five minute job by any means. Well, Probably it now. sounds like you had a lot of fun doing it in the meantime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I did make my husband test drive it. Um, <laughs> he told me that this is way too hard. Like, what are you, like, what grade is this for? I said, oh, you're three. He's like, they're never going to be able to do this. He's a teacher, but he was very doubtful. <laughs> Fiona, yeah. I've just got a comment. Um, I'm just, I loved, like, uh, you hear the thing from teachers about covering content, but what you did <laughs> is you inspired learning. So I would imagine that haiku and boys, it does, they don't go very well together, but you created <laughs> purpose. And you gave you this was a Trojan horse to actually help them unpack. Well, you need to know this. So I I think that those kids who are who experienced it will remember haikus for a long, long time because oh, I had to unlock a, unlock a code. So well done. Yeah, thank you. It was um, I had a I've got a boy who has a um, an aide until lunchtime. He's um, high functioning Asperger's, and he said to me at the start, he's like. Um, Mrs. Hudson, I'm not good at cracking code, so I won't be able to do this. I said, oh, just work with, you know, work with your aide, you know, work with Mrs. Val, see how you go. Well, she did nothing. Um, he did it himself. And, yeah, he knows all that haikus now. Awesome. Yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. And I think sometimes, you know, don't spend the whole more time than the kids on a lesson. <laughs> I think that was me this week. I think it took me three nights to put all these <laughs> challenge questions together and make sure the QR codes had the correct answers and test them out and make sure they all work. But at the end of the day, what actually came from that lesson and what the students understood was much more than what I could have done doing something I'd already done before. So. It depends and you know as teachers we have to sometimes not every lesson if I did that for every lesson oh, <laughs> well, I don't think I have any spare time but you pick the ones you want and if you really want something to work you'll make it and find the time to make it work and I think that was fantastic and as you said next time it will become easier and now I've actually got my students making the next lot of questions so put it back yeah. on them to apply their knowledge so you know eventually your students could actually make their own breakout edu challenges and then Absolutely, see yeah. you can reuse them as well yeah definitely wonderful um next up and final person for the show is trent so let me know trent when you're ready and i will start the timer i'm ready to go can you see my screen and hear me yep all good awesome Alrighty. Um, well, thanks for having me on again, Lenny. Um, I wanted to share with you something that we did in your classroom um, around a product called Make Do, um, which I was very excited when I was shown um, what a Make Do screw was. Um, and the idea is that you can use them to um, help little kids join cardboard together really quickly and easily. I know when I've done cardboard projects with kids in the past, you've had to have very strong masking tape or um, you know, trying to find really creative ways to actually get cardboard to stick together and construct it. Um, and so it, it, it really helps us to um, get straight into the, the building and creating and making. Um, so I was presented with this opportunity to design some learning around the use of make do. Um, and uh, we decided to test it out on a Lenny students. 
Um, and what we did was we, we, um, we needed a few things. We needed some cardboard. We needed the make do screws. Um, and that was all well and good. But what I wanted to do was kind of wrap some of the more contemporary pedagogies around them. And we've certainly been talking about that today with the different types of thinking, the design thinking. Um, and I really wanted to bring it into the, the 21st century and give the Lenny students and the students that we work on with this project in the future um, some deeper learning that we wrap around some cardboard and these make do screws. Um, so we started off with just finding lots of cardboard that we could actually use for the project. Um, we, um, you can use cardboard of any shape and size and make do work inside of those. We got some make do kits from make do which includes make do screws, screwdrivers and these special safe saws which are really good for kids to cut cardboard with. So they're not using Stanley knives. Um, and then the big thinking that we had to wrap around, it was main, mainly in that third column that you can see on the screen, which was looking at how does it link in with the design and technologies curriculum. Um, there was a lot of art curriculum that we could bring into this as well. So making sure we're ticking off some of those boxes and then thinking about how we could build some skills with these students to actually bring them to the 21st century and provide them with an opportunity to learn how to be collaborative because we decided to make it a team effort and a team project. So the, um, the, the project we posed to the student was to create an indigenous creature with a 21st century twist. And so using cardboard to build and construct and make something uh, that has a, potentially a, a solution to a problem that an animal might face. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about one of my favorite innovations that were created. Um, and so in, here's me in the Lenny's classroom. Um, I was showing them an example of a little koala that I made out of cardboard with make do. And we read um, the story Wombat Stew. For those in Australia, it's a very iconic book that um, lots of kids in Australia love to read along with, um, just to get them thinking about the different types of Australian animals that they might be able to create and make. Um, we then wrapped around a little bit of a scaffold for them to work with. They all got a clipboard with lots of pieces of paper and we scaffold the task for them um, to follow the process and linking it directly to the um, design and technologies curriculum. So you can see here, we kind of followed the processes of um, what's in the Australian curriculum. One um, and then, then we then put out the, um, the actual curriculum elements so that we knew that we could assess those and the students work through um, the design process. We also wrapped around um, the 21st century learning design framework collaboration decision tree, which helps us to actually think more deeply about how we wrap collaborative skill building in our lessons. So if you want to learn more about that, I'll put a link up on the screen about the 21st century learning design framework. Um, and uh, then we went through a bit of time. Here's a picture of the kids actually working through the process. So they started with investigating the screws and the cardboard and how to cut it, how to fold it safely, what they could create and make. And then they worked through this process to actually then design their um, Australian animal, work to produce in teams, uh, and then one of the final steps was to actually evaluate how well they went in meeting the design brief and then um, some of the things that they did uh, along the way that might have been challenging, some of the things that changed from their designs. Um, and then we assessed them at the end with this final sort of booklet that they worked together collaboratively on. They all had roles that they had to, to do um, to complete, so to ensure that the actual tasks themselves were actually interconnected. And you can see here that this is the final product of what they actually created. So these are the little uh, Australian animals that they all worked to build and are very proud of them. And they actually went on display at Federation Square during the Arts Learning Festival uh, here in Melbourne in May. Um, just really quickly, we're going to extend this to the next level and we're going to take a few teachers through this project again in 2018 and we're going to try and integrate more of a STEM and digital technologies focus by putting some moving parts onto the animals. Um, one of my favourite uh, creations that was made was actually a wombat with a reversing camera to help him walk backwards, um, which was a pretty cool little project that was created with a group of grade two students. So um, that's it for me. If you want more about 21TLD, there's some links on the screen now and I've written a blog about the project as well on my website which is collectiveeducation.com.au. Fantastic Thanks, Lenny. and I must say it is one of those learning experiences now that my students keep asking whenever we have tinker time they keep saying is Mr Ray coming in is Mr Ray coming in so whenever I say oh we've got a special guest they're now hoping that it's always you so you really left a mark oh. on my Students. But the whole thinking around it and the design of that lesson that you came in and taught um, really sort of was, um, it was so great the way that you connected that 21CLD. I know I have completed the course with you last year and to see it 
fully in action, a whole lesson built around it has really sort of got my thinking and moving around it. And I highly recommend it almost needs to be a compulsory course for every teacher, I believe, the 21 CLD, just to get your thinking, get your processing of what you're doing and ways you can improve it even more. So I highly recommend anyone who is interested in it to reach out to Trent and definitely do the course because I must say in my five years of teach, six years of teaching, it has been one of my favourite courses to do. So um, definitely reach out. It's worthwhile. Any other questions? Did the kids get a chance to see the... Uh, the pieces at Fed Square? So we unfortunately didn't get to go yeah. and see them because it was actually nap plan week here. And obviously being free, we couldn't really go on an excursion to the city, but Trent sent us photos. So they got to see them on display. And I do know yeah. a couple of parents went through and did have a look at them and take yeah. photos as well who were in the city. So they did get to see what it looked like in there, but no, we didn't actually physically get to go because a week it fell on was not ideal. <laughs> Um, Trent, can I just ask, I've looked at make do for the classroom, how many like, kits or sets of like the, was it the basic make do kit or there's like an yeah. extension kit or like, how did you go about having enough and um, yeah. <laughs> so make do um, get, sent me a, a, like a kit of um, the screws and the, um, and the screwdrivers and the saws. And I looked at it thinking this is not going to be enough for us to actually use with an entire class of students. There were five massive sort of cardboard projects that be, were being worked on. Um, in terms of it, I, I think we used one and a half packets of screws across the whole class and there was uh, five screwdrivers and they all took it in turns to actually use the tools and equipment together. So we were talking about working collaboratively, working with one another and not all needing to have a screwdriver and not all needing to have a saw. Um, so you can you could do this project basically with about one and a half packets of screws and about five screwdrivers. Awesome, great to know. <laughs> no worries. There's also, I've put a, that scaffold up on the blog as well so you can download the actual um, lesson that we used in Eleni's classroom too. And awesome. Fiona, in answer to that, we've actually bought now one teacher make do kit and that's been enough for one to two classes. So, but we have got smaller classes where I am, but um, yeah, so, and as Trent said, once they've been created and, you know, you could have them on display, you can actually dismantle them as well and reuse them if you need to as well. Yeah. So, yeah. cool. So that actually brings us, were there any other questions for Trent? No. Oh, good. Easy. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. And as I said, next month's episode for July, we actually won't be running one. The reason for that is we have been very lucky to be going to ISTE. So, um, Steve, Corey and myself will be over in San Antonio later this month and we will be presenting on Teach Tech Play as a learning community and how we share STEM and how we share lots of things from everybody around the world. So um, technically everyone who views, everyone who watches, you guys are part of that. Um, so we will be at ISTE. If you are going to ISTE, please reach out to us. Let us know via our hashtag TT Play. We would love to connect with fellow educators, especially those in the US who do tune in and watch. Um, so yes, we won't be around next month in July. I think we're all off on a little bit of a holiday after that, um, rewarding ourselves after the conference last holidays. But we will be back in August for our episode 32. If you do have any questions or want to reach out to us, please do via the hashtag on Twitter. Also have a look on our website. Our website is full of resources and we have just started a blog component. It's very new still. We are working on it, but we are getting people who present on the show to sort of share what they're doing. So last month we had Ben shared droning in the droning, drones in the classroom, helps if I can speak, and he has written a blog post there that you can see. There's also the five Ps that I shared last two months ago, actually, or last month up there as well. So there are a few blog posts and we're hoping to add to that as well. So if you want to share something on the show, please reach out to us, let us know, because we're always looking for people to share the wonderful things and to connect with others. So 
Um, make sure you do vote and check out the web show for past shows. And we look forward to meeting a few people, hopefully at ISTE. And if not, we'll see you in August. Steve, did you want to say anything? Yeah, once again, I am so glad that I didn't present on this show. My God, the quality is just getting better and better. So I want to say thank you to our presenters because the richness, I know that I walked away from last month's show and had so many ideas and things to try. And I know once again, that I'm going to get out my make do kits. I'm going to be looking at the laser cutters. There's all of this amazing learning. Um, so thank you to our presenters. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing everybody in August. Well, Steve, I've now combined two of our presenters in an idea because our next unit on space, I'm going to incorporate space and break out EDU and create something. So, and make do. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Just squeeze I'm going to either reach out to you though for some help and same with you, Trevor, but we might try and do something. So I'll let you know how it goes, but definitely keep in contact with us. Um, we want to know what people are doing. Share what you're doing. If you try something that you've learnt from our shows, just use a hashtag, share it out. We'd love to see and um, what people are doing in their class. So huge thank you to our presenters for joining us and we look forward to continuing learning and sharing from each other. So thanks everyone. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone.